Hi, um, welcome to today's video and today we'll be talking about the top 10 culture shocks when moving to Australia. Um, and by definition, essentially a culture shock is, you know, that feeling of disorientation you experience, especially when you're faced with a different culture and usually it's uh, an unfamiliar culture. So um, today essentially we'll be talking about, you know, that sort of disorientation, that sort of change that you experience when you move to Australia. And I'll just be going through various um, of the culture shocks that I did experience that I know a lot of other people do experience as well. My name is Anna, and if you're new here, welcome. If you're my returning subscriber, thank you so much for always keeping it here and uh, look out for more content um, on this. So essentially what was my biggest culture shock coming to Australia is the informal sort of way of addressing people. And this was very different for me because obviously I was coming into the workplace and um, and um, upon arrival, I just discovered that people call each other by first name basis. Obviously, having lived um, in, in, in Kenya, usually, you know, your bosses, you address them by Dr. So-and-so, you address them by, you know, professor, if they're a professor. And up to date, even when I visit at home, I still find it hard, you know, to call my mom's doctor by name. I still say Dr. So-and-so. So essentially, you know, when you come to Australia, that's the biggest um, sort of shock you sort of experience because then you don't know uh, you know habits are hard to die so usually because you're so used to calling your your other colleagues by you know titles so here even the head of department even you know a departmental head you still will find that people call them by their first name and obviously that for me was a major shock the other thing that I did notice is a lot of times people call you with this you know adjectives so you find patients calling you hi love hi hi darling hi idea and for me that was different <laughs> it was quite different but obviously as you settle in you find yourself as well using the similar things because obviously when you go to the bedside you go like hi dear how's your morning and how are you going and sort of things like that so that was a major culture shock for me just addressing people and how patients and how your colleagues address you, you know, using those, you know, little dear, love, Han, sweetie, you know, and obviously that was quite different for me. The second culture shock that you're likely to experience is work-life balance. Australians actually are there to work-life balance. And this for me was such a pleasant um, shock because obviously, again, you know, um, the work, you know, the environment that I was used to, um, you know, you know, where we going to work all the time and stuff like that. One thing that I have learned about Australians is they value specific things and whatever they value, they create time for it. So you find, you know, people are into sports, people are, you know, into family life, people are into, you know, uh, you know, their kids um, activities and stuff like that. And uh, because of that, because of, you know, work life balance, people, when they're choosing their careers, they actually factor that in mind. So you'll find that some people will actually, you know, settle in for some, you know, specific jobs just so that that job gives them the work life balance they experience. A lot of my general practitioner friends are actually doing general practice because they feel it gives them, you know, that ability to, you know, multitask, be there and stuff like that. And even the specialist, I have found a lot of specialists here work in group practices. And the fact that they work in group practices allows them, you know, that ability to, you know, when they're at work, they're at work. And when they're away from work, they're away from work. And then the other thing that I've seen is a lot of people work part time. So you'll find someone is working on a point six, a point actually even a point two, which is essentially just two days in a fortnight or four days in a fortnight. Or some people start late and finish early. So you, I have had colleagues, you know, especially, you know, in general practice and even in, in hospital setup where somebody comes to start work at nine so that it allows them to drop their kids to school at 830 and then they finish work at 230 just in time to pick their kids from school. So that's something that I really commend Australians for, you know, the ability to be flexible enough. And even the major specialists, the surgeons, you know, uh, I, I've worked at this hospital where, you know, 
during school holidays, all the elective cases close, you know. So people don't do elective cases over school holidays. And that's just so that, you know, you know, all the staff that work in theater and all the, you know, specialist doctors can actually get time, you know, to, to, you know, to work away from, to be away from work and to do other things. And in line with that work-life balance, Australians actually value holiday and vacation. You know, you'll hear one saying, I'm either going to a vacation or I've come out from one or I'm planning a vacation. So I find that they actually, they actually put in time to and save up actually to go for vacation. And most times than not, and 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 for me it was it's a little bit you know it was a little bit different uh, when i started working here because you know they'll ask you have you been oh you're from kenya have you been to the masai mara have you been to um south africa you know so all of them like around tea time will be talking about where they've visited what they've done you know um you know and and sometimes it can be you know <laughs> a little full on especially if you haven't traveled much yourself and obviously there's very little you can you know uh, contribute but that's uh, something that I, I have found here to be to be quite you know people actually actually plan for vacations people actually <clears throat> plan to be available for other things apart from work and I feel like as a parent this is really good because then you can be there for your kids activities sports activities um, and even, you know, uh, yeah, school meetings and stuff like that, which is something that was quite, you know, not common where I used to work before. And, um, you know, if just to add on that, you know, the ability to be able to like if you needed to take time off work and attend to a loved one or a sick sick loved one or a sick child you know you don't feel guilty calling in to say look i have my child's unwell or something like that you can easily just um you know uh, with all honesty you know uh, call and say um my young one is unwell and i'm unable to come in or i'm not feeling well and i'm not able to come in so that work-life balance is a big a big one for me that i did experience and it was a good one that i'm trying to work on as well so the third culture shock that I did experience was the words or the Aussie slang that's used here um, for me I, I I wasn't sure of some things and that's both for you know the medical terms and the non-medical terms like when I first came you know you know the way we ask patients um, in Swahili, uh, umen or, you know, here, you know, if you directly translate it is, uh, <laughs> have you gone to the toilet or, uh, have you passed pools or something like that? So, uh, when I came here, you know, at home, it's tool and stuff like that. I learned to use, you know, we and pools. I learned to ask, uh, how's your water works, which is essentially how's, you know, do you have any problems with passing urine? And then, you know, I learned things like, you know, we were used to saying a branula, which is, you know, a cannula. So you, you know, when someone tells you, do you want to um, insert a cannula for me? You know, you're like cannula for me. Uh, you're used to saying branula or someone says, can you change the IVT order for me? So that's intravenous um, uh, therapy. And Australians find every reason to use short 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 words like they can abbreviate everything ivt um i just learned the other day after long you know this long time of being in australia sobb you know a physiotherapist would write in the file sobb what's sobb anyway it's sitting out of bed you know they'll write ator so at time of review i'm just like oh so many abbreviations so you know a lot of that was came in did not come in naturally for me obviously and then you know things like um you know the Aussie slang itself where you know they'll say um you, you go out uh, to eat and then someone will say i'll say like i'll shout you know so i'll i'll be paying for for today and something like that or it's my treat today so Obviously, you know, it takes time before you learn that. And it's interesting that I've remembered that because one other thing is um, there was a shock as well is the fact that, you know, when you go out for a meal, 
you know you know in kenya when somebody invites you out for a meal let's go out for dinner or something like this most times the other ones paying but here in australia please take care of your own bills you know when you go out when somebody invites you for a birthday party or somebody to invites you out for drinks and stuff like that go in knowing that whatever you eat you have to pay for it okay so don't assume that um you know so and so has invited me they'll take care of the bills now remember when it comes to paying everybody you will actually see everybody is sort of you know saying i ate this and this and this and this is my part of the bill i still haven't gotten used to that because i still find it hard to ask my friends to pay for bills so anyway but that's the shock that i did experience and obviously um you know you just have to go with the flow and um, learn to do that the fourth culture shock that um i did experience is you know um there is a lot of mutual respect you know there's a lot of mutual respect there is a lot of kindness to one another i mean there's a lot of so i'm sorry there's a lot of thank yous there's a lot of excuse me and usually even when you're inserting a cannula for a patient or you have to be kind i'm sorry this is going to uh, be so but we need to do it are you happy for me to proceed and you know you have to keep you know asking for permission are you happy Would you like me to um can i go ahead and stuff like that and then they go like out out uh you have to ask do you want me to continue do you want me to stop and stuff like that so uh and 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 in, in the same way you know um you know um uh, the most i must say most there are a few obviously outliers most of the patients as well are quite you know respectful kind and even not even only patients on the road a lot of you know people will say hi how are you uh people will say you know um do you want to sit or you know would you like to sit or do you want to take my seat and stuff like that which is you know obviously you just assume the first world people will be snobbish and stuff like that australians are actually pretty good at um saying thank yous i'm sorry excuse me can i help you um you know if you're struggling to pull a, a stroller from you know the car someone will offer and say can i can i help you and stuff like that so a lot of uh, you know offers for help and stuff like that are quite available the other thing obviously the big another big culture shock that i experienced was the weather the weather in australia can be Oh my goodness I still struggle with summers you know the summers can be extremely extremely hot 40 degrees you know burning scorching the aircon is not even you know you know I it's still something that I you know I still struggle with especially the summers they can be very hot the winters are cold good thing is there's no snow where I stay so that's pretty good Uh, but obviously i don't mind winter because then you can just layer up and you know your air con full blast and stuff like that and just wait wait for the bills so um that's the thing but the weather's can be quite extreme and the interesting thing about australians is you know they will just slip slop put on you know uh, their bathers put on sunscreen and you know you still find them outdoors like it's a scorching you know december afternoon and they're still outdoors they are still outdoors they still are very outdoor people they will still be by the beach they will still be you know in most of the parks obviously they will have their hats on they will have their sunscreens on they will have their their what do you call this they would have their gazebos they would have you know their sheds and their umbrellas and stuff like that so they are very sun conscious in terms of like protecting themselves but that alone will not keep them indoors they will still go out and enjoy themselves fully fully the other shock that i got oh my goodness was house hunting you know at home if you have money you will get whichever house you want you just rock up you have your deposit you speak to the owners either directly or via an agency you provide you know to even i can't even remember if we used to provide identification maybe now um, I'm not too sure but I remember it wasn't a stringent process getting yourself a rental you know a rental house it was pretty straightforward but here you have to apply for you know um and look out for a video of you know how to get a rental in Australia but essentially you will have to um 
uh, you know, first get onto the sites that are, you know, for rentals, um, most of the times is real estate domain or, you know, even things like flatmate and stuff. And then you have to look for an inspection date. You have to go inspect the house and then you have to put in your applications. My goodness, it's like you're applying for a job. You have to put in a, an application. You have to provide evidence of your financials. And then you have to provide references who will be contacted, including your previous, you know, um, you know, a property manager who was like in the previ previous house. Or if you're new in Australia, then the people that you're staying with have to say something about you. So the references will be sought. And after that, only after that will you get a house. So you can find that you're searching for a house up to four to six weeks before you land yourself a rental or even higher now that, you know, the, you know, the rental market is a bit of, you know, in, a, in, in sort of um, a busy uh, time. So do not expect to find, you know, a house that quickly be open and have some form of, you know, uh, backup, you know, accommodation, even as you house hunt for your permanent rental. It can take you a while. Um, and obviously you need your financials in place and your documents and, you know, um, they need the backing to see before they give you a house. So be mindful of that. The other thing that goes hand in hand is when the other found is what I call quote unquote roadside shopping. So in Australia you will find certain times of the year people put out you know stuff that they don't need and then um, so people will put out you know like let's say I've bought a new couch I will put my old couch outside or I will and when I say outside it's just on the verge and anything on the verge uh, away from the letterbox can be taken you know, can be taken by, you know, someone who's driving past. So every, you know, all the estates, hack, it happens at different times of the year. And then obviously, you know, people put out what they don't need, carpets, you know, a bedding, um, you know, um, kitchen stuff, you know, um, couches, um, lawn mowers, do essentially anything you can think about is put outside. And if some, an, 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 um, an electrical thing is not working, most times they will say not working or they will say working. So that if things are not working, you don't take them, then the council people will eventually, at the end of that period, so they give it a certain amount of time, at the end of that period, people will take what they need from your verge and whatever is not needed or whatever is spoiled, the council will come and pick it and dispose it for them. So... On roadside shopping, you can actually get some good bargains on roadside shopping. So um, <laughs> I must say, you know, like, you know, you know, when we first, when I first saw this and, you know, when, <laughs> when, when, <laughs> when my, you know, you know, anyway, I won't say when, when we first saw this and uh, me and, you know, my mother-in-law would walk, you know, the streets and we would see this and we would say, that's so good. And then we would see this and say, sad, that's so good. And we would see so many toys and we would see so much. So, you know, you, your thought process or your African. mind or your mind at that point is thinking, oh, I can have this, I can have this. Until you realize, oh my goodness, these things are too much. You actually do not need a lot of them, you probably may need one or two things. And I actually have had a few bargains from the roadside shopping. So look out for that time of the year. And that's one major big shocks that you I found here that I have not seen anywhere else. I don't know if it happens in other countries as well, but definitely roadside shopping or roadside, you know, people put things on the verge that actually are in good um, quality that can actually be used uh, by another person. So the other shock that I found was the leisure activities. Australians, like I already mentioned, value their leisure activities. People will plan, you know, people will, when it's AFL season or when it's the Melbourne Cup or when people will take time away from work, you know, people will, you know, will say, um, you know, will swap shifts just because I want to go to watch an AFL game or I want to go to the Melbourne Cup or I want to do this and this and this. That's how much people value their leisure activities. People, you know, alcohol is readily available in Australia, I must say, and I'm told it's quite cheap as well. You can get alcohol very cheaply. And then the other thing is, you know, you'll find a lot of times, you know, um, 
you know, even your colleagues at work, one's doing this sport, one's doing this sport, one's doing this sport. And sometimes, you know, if you're not a sporty person like myself, you don't have a lot to contribute, especially when people are talking about we went swimming or we went surf kite, you know, is it called kiting? That one, or we went, you know, uh, canoeing, or we went to play golf, or we went to play, you know, this and this and this. So Australians value their leisure activities. They plan for their leisure activities. They take time off work to go and have fun. And they value their um, barbecue when they're out at it. They value their snugs. They value their, you know, people are always, you know, People love their barbecues anyway. So they use that opportunity to bond and they also use that opportunity just to hang out and have fun. Um, I think the ninth uh, shock that I've seen is, I didn't know, I did not expect, you know, is people walking barefoot in Australia. Australians love walking barefoot, even when it's hot. I don't even know how they do it. You'll find people barefoot. Obviously, you know, this was different for me because, you know, at home, we are, you know, everybody's striving not to walk barefoot, you know, people are striving to get shoes, people are striving to get, you know, what we call here thongs or sleepers at home, you know, at least have something. But here people actually, you know, you may find, you know, a whole family kids are walking barefoot and don't be surprised and don't look, you know, funny. And uh, in addition to that, you know, um, you know, people are, can be quite informal, you know, like on Sundays, uh, you know, when... In Africa, we dress up for church and we dress up and we dress up and, you know, we call it our Sunday best here. You know, people, someone will just wear their uh, shorts and, you know, their sneakers and they will go to church. The pastor will wear skinny jeans and they will be out there and still preach and the word will still come out. So that obviously was a shocker for me because, you know, I was used to my pastor wearing a suit every Sunday, you know, a tie and stuff like that, Sunday best and all that. So obviously it was a bit different to see, you know, yeah, to see that sort of different um, environment. But I still dress up for church. I still, I still, that, you know, habits are hard to die. I still try to dress up for church. And the last one is, uh, like I said, uh, you know, people here are very friendly. People will say sorry, thank you. People, you know, um, will will be kind to one another. And um, I know a lot of people have said there are a lot of reptiles in Australia. I don't refute that. I have had a lot of stories about reptiles, but I have been, when I say reptiles, you know, it's snakes, it's, you know, this and this, but I've been lucky. I've been lucky. I haven't so far met up with a snake. So that's really good. But I know of friends, especially, you know, in some areas who say, oh, I've seen a snake, I've seen a brown snake, I've seen this, I've seen this, but I've been very, very lucky, very lucky I am. So those are, there is so much more that I can say about that I, exper that I experienced and I still experience that it's still a culture shock to me, but I feel like these are the main ones. And um, obviously, you know, <laughs> obviously um, it takes you a while before you get used to it and before you realize it, you know, you just, that becomes also your nature of life. And, you know, the Aussie slang grows up on you slowly. I still can't say good day or something like that. But obviously, you know, you know, my children and, you know, they, 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 they you know, it's grown up on them and they can, they can say that. So uh, if you're coming to Australia, you know, um, just, uh, you know, realize that this is a culture shock you'll experience. It will be in stages. It will be, you know, the initial honeymoon stage and then the anxiety stage when you're wondering and the frustration is coming in. And then obviously then you will come to the adjustment stage where now you're adjusting to the changes that you're experiencing. And then eventually you'll get to the mastery stage where now you've adapted, you know, it's the way of life. You understand, you know, even when people swear at work, you know, oh, that's their way of life and stuff like that. And then that makes you, you know, feel like, you know, your sense of belonging and, you know, your, your migration sort of status starts to kick in. So thank you so much for finding time to join me today. And again, like I said, um, join me, join the family. And if this is um, rings a bell or you have someone coming to Australia, share this content so people come in well prepared. Thanks again.